ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المأثومين المذلومين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق والأصدق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقد أضلوا كثيرا ولا تزد الظالمين إلا ظلالا مما خطيئاتهم أغرقوا فأدخلوا نارا فلم يجدوا لهم من دون الله أنصارا وقال نوح ربي لا تضر على الأرض من الكافرين ديارا إنك إن تضرهم يضلوا إبادك ولا يلدوا إلا فاجرا كفارا رب اغفر لي ولوالدي ولمن دخل بيتي مؤمنا وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات ولا تزد الظالمين إلا تبارا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صدع على محمد وعلي Philosophers over the centuries have debated on the nature of the human being. One group of philosophers, they come forth and they state that the human being has been created perfect without any sort of blemish in the absolute perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's nature. The question that is often posed toward this group of philosophers is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being perfect, then what are the roles and responsibilities of that human being if he's already attained the height of all of creation? A second group of philosophers, they come forth and they state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has created the human being full of flaws and blemishes. The question that is posed to these is that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create a creation which is imperfect? For centuries this debate has raged on, Some state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the human being with some aspects of perfection and other aspects of imperfection and so on and so forth. And what is often founded in the books of philosophy in regards to historical conclusions that many of these academics have come toward. But when we go to the whole Qur'an, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents a unique answer in regards to the true nature of the human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah At-Teen, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa teen wa zaytoon, wa tur sinin wa hadha al-balad al-ameen, laqad khalaqna al-insan fi ahsana taqweeh. That we have created the human being in the best of forms. So on one side, the human being is perfect. Laqad khalaqna al-insan fi ahsana taqweeh, thumma radadnahu asfala safileen. After we had created him in the best of forms, we lowered him to the lowest of lows. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَأَمِلُوا الصَّالَحَاتِ فَلَهُمْ أَجْرٌ غَيْرُ مَمْنُونَ Except for those who worship, and except for those who believe, and except for those who fulfill the responsibilities toward God. Meaning what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the human being with all sorts of aspects or dimensions of perfection, but then God lowered him. God put him through trials, put him through tribulations, removed Adam from paradise, allowed him to descend onto the earth, and now it becomes the responsibility of the human being to live up to that potential, to live up to his actual true nature, and to make sure that he is not caught up in all of the vices of society that surround him. The human being often goes through different stages in their life where they have to make choices. They have certain examinations where they may overcome. We see, for instance, when a child, when a student, they're sitting in a classroom, if they fail that examination that, need, that, that they need to take to get into the next grade or to get into the next class or to complete that particular course, there's always an opportunity to take the exam again. You fail it one time, you fail your SAT one time, you go ahead and you're able to take it again the next month or the next year. You could take it a hundred times because the door of opportunity is open for you forever. But when it comes to the examinations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we also see that the door of opportunity is open. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we take that exam that He has offered toward us, and we treat it as something insignificant, 
We treat it as something that is not vital, that is not important for my success in this life and in the next life. Then perhaps that God will close down, will close that door and will lock us out and we won't have any more opportunities. We mentioned yesterday in the verse of chapter 71 of the whole of Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He states, وَقَدْ أَبَلُّوا كَثِيرًا وَلَا تَزَدُ الظَّالَمِينَ إِلَّا ضَلَالًا He states about that community of Prophet Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, that we gave them 950 years worth of opportunity. 950 years, the door was opened for them to be those who were receptive to the mercy and the blessing and the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَدْ أَبَلُّوا كَثِيرًا but every time we kept that door wide open for them, they said, we want to walk from all of the other doors. We don't want to follow this particular legislation that the Prophet has brought toward us. We come forth and we see this is the nature of the human being as he mentioned time and time again. They didn't want to listen to the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they were too arrogant to follow in that instruction. We see, for instance, that when Musa alayhi salatu wasalam he saved the people from Fir'aun and they began to enter into Palestine. We come and we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this several times within the whole of Quran that as they were about to enter into the city, he looks back toward his community and he says, look, before we enter into the city, we need to make sure that you listen to my instruction. They said, oh Musa, you are the one who saved us. Whatever you tell us, we're going to submit to what you have to say. It is, it is said that at this moment, Musa والسلام, says that when you're going to enter into the city, back then traditionally, every single major city was, had, had a massive fort around it. Thus there were several different doors by which the people could enter into that particular town, into that city. Like for instance, when we're driving to Canada, there are several different outlets of the border to get to Toronto, for instance. You can enter through Niagara Falls, you can enter through this border, you can enter through that border. There are different types of entrances that one can take. Similarly, was all of the old classical cities during, those, during that day and age. So it is said that Musa والسلام, says, I want you to enter through this door, what is known as Bab al hitta Enter through this door. And when you're entering through this door, before you enter, enter in the state of prostration, meaning as you're about to enter into the door, go into the state of sujood, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your sins, and then enter through the door. As you're humbling yourself, in front of God. They looked at Musa alayhi salam and they said, oh Musa, seriously? We have to perform prostration and then crawl into the door? Now we're not going to do that. One began to walk from X door, one began to walk from Y door. So maybe some people, they began to run through the door. Some people, they began to walk backwards. Some people, they began to do the moonwalk. I have no idea, right? They began to do everything else except for follow the instruction of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. What happened? These individuals, eventually they would see that they fall into this misguidance just because of this small instruction that the Prophet gave them, and they were up for destruction. In a narration from the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, he states, Inna mathalu ahl bayti ka mathali bab That surely the similarity or the similitude of my family is like that of bab al hitta like that door of Musa. I told them, the Holy Prophet, he says, I told them to follow Ali ibn Abi Talib after me, but they said, we'll follow anyone except for Ali ibn Abi Talib. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Musa, uh, Musa alayhi salam told, told them to enter through the door. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi said, follow Ali. Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, what did he tell them? He said, just board the ark for God's sake. What's it going to hurt you if you don't board the ark? What's it going to hurt you? At the very least, you know, we're going to go on a trip, we're going to go on a boat ride, they're all going to come home, if this flood is really not going to take place, right? But they said, oh, Musa, we're not going to do that. And because of that building up of arrogance and building and creating that veil between their heart and the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَقَدْ أَبَلُّوا كَثِيرًا وَلَا تَزَدُ الظَّالَمِينَ إِلَّا ضَلَالًا So, the more that they went astray, God increased their misguidance so that there's no more outlet for them to turn back. They fail the exam and there's no more opportunities after this for this group of individuals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues in verse number 25 of chapter 71 of the Holy Quran. مِمَّا خَتِيَاتِهِمْ أُغْرِقُوا فَأُدْخِلُوا نَارًا فَلَمْ يَجِدُوا لَهُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْصَارًا Let's go ahead and take a look at this one by one. مِمَّا خَتِيَاتِهِمْ أُغْرِقُوا 
due to their sins as a direct cause of their lapses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala drowned them. We went and we stated that Nuh Nu alayhi salatu wasalam, the prophets of God, it was their custom, it was their responsibility to make sure that they offer opportunities several times toward the prophets, to, toward their community. They would always give them guidance. They would always give them consultation. They would always present toward them wisdom. And when they felt that they would not be receptive toward the wisdom of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the prophets would come and warn them. They would not bring forth the punishment just like that. They came with a warning. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the very first verse of chapter 71 of Surah Nuh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna arsalna Nuhan ila qawmihi an anzar qawmaka min qabl that Nuh was sent at this particular time when he realized that the community was no longer going to be able to be receptive toward them and told them, look, be careful. If you don't follow my instruction, the entire community is going to drown. Right? But constantly they said, oh, Nuh, we're not going to listen to anything that you have to say. Going back toward the verse, As a direct consequence of their transgressions, God drowned. We go and we see that in the theory of Ahl al-Bayt we have a concept of what is known as At-Tajseed al-A'mal. At-Tajseed al-A'mal means that your actions, our acts of worship, our good deeds, our bad deeds, they take a physical form, right? We don't necessarily see that physical form, but it is present around us in what is known as Alab al-Malakut, in, in what is known as the spiritual dimension of this world. Let me give you an example. The one who prays or the one who does this a'mal on the first Thursday of the month of Rajab. We all performed the a'mal known as a'mal Laylatul Raghab. Many of us, we came, we performed it in this masjid together. When you perform that a'mal, the narration states that on the day, that on the first day that you pass away in your grave, that there's going to be a man who enters into your grave and who presents toward you fruits and presents toward you all of these gifts and tells you, don't worry, that you are okay. Don't, don't fear, for today is a day in which you attain reward and blessing. There's nothing for you to fear today. As a direct result of that particular prayer that we did, God gives us a physical blessing that we can understand, that we can relate to, and that we will be able to attain those fruits of the act of our worship. Similarly, for instance, if we fast during the holy month of Ramadan, if we recite X du'a or Y, or y du'a or Z du'a, right, we will be able to attain physical blessings in the barzakh, or in the afterlife, and we can go ahead and read the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt that tell us about what enjoyments that we are going to you know, benefit from by performing such and such a'mal and acts of worship. Similarly, on the flip side, if an individual, he commits an act of sin, he commits an act of transgression, God will punish him by means sometimes of direct consequences on the basis of the a'mal that he performed. They're real, they're physical things that follow us. When we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, for instance, that punishment that is running behind us, it just dies and it falls away. Similarly, if we are, you know, uh, performing a good deed, we are, thank, you know, we, 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 we are thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for receiving blessings or seeking forgiveness or performing salatul layl or reciting dua al-iftita, all of these type of things, they allow for certain a'mal or certain um, uh, benefits or blessings to become physical and follow us behind us, walk next to us, and so on and so forth. And we will be able to attain the physicality of that blessing after we pass away. Which is why Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Nuh in this particular chapter, that as a direct consequence of their sins, they drowned. It wasn't necessarily that physical drowning only that we're talking about, but every single time that they sin and every single time that they're transgressing in the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, slowly their hearts are drowning. Their hearts and their souls are drowning in darkness and in a lack of light and in a lack of understanding and in ignorance until the physical punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, which is the direct rainfall and the direct flooding which takes place to that community, which drowns everyone within that society. A question that many of us pose when it comes to the story of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. And that is, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send down a flood that drowned the entire community, that, that, that drowned the entire world? Or was it only limited toward that region where Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam was preaching? One group of scholars, they come forth and they state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down this rainfall and it wipes out the entire world 
except for those few followers of Nuh والسلام, who boarded the ark. We come forth and we state that this is probably illogical and perhaps out of the injustice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because why would God punish people on the other side of the world who never heard the lesson of Nuh who never heard the wisdom, who never heard the revelation of Nuh Another group will state no, that this did take place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did drown the entire world, but there were no people on the other side of the world. Right? Back then it was the earlier generation, maybe Nuh according to narrations, is in the first you know, dozen prophets of God, and they're only limited to one geographical region. The second question that, might, that, that people might pose is, okay, if we submit to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the punishment and drowned only the people, only the community of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, how about children? How about people who were, you know, unable to intellectually grasp the message of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam? When a child is not badr, when he has not attained adulthood, God cannot punish him for his sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is just and he's the all-merciful and he's the all-wise. How could God punish a child who doesn't know the difference between right and wrong in this case? Well, if you recall a couple of nights ago, we mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, amongst the punishments that he brought forth toward the people of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, was the fact that he, that, that, that he caused all of the women within the community to become sterile. They were unable to give, they were, they were unable to give birth to children. For 40 years, this punishment took place within that community. Thus, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Nuh, oh Nuh, your dua is going to be accepted and we're going to bring down this punishment, God postponed that punishment for 40 years because he wanted those children to grow into adulthood where they're able to determine whether they're going to board the ark with Nuh or they're not going to board that ark out of the wisdom and out of the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we go back toward the verse of the whole Qur'an. And we come forth and we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, That we drown them and then we force them to enter into the fire. Meaning that for these individuals, there's no sense of or potential of recourse. They're going to be amongst those who receive the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَمْ يَجِدُوا لَهُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْسَارَ and they will not find any of their idols to help them on that day when they are receiving the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number 26. وَقَالَ نُوهٌ رَبِّي لَا تَضَرْ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ دَيَّارٌ Then Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, after God promised him that punishment is going to take place and that community is going to drown, he raises his hands toward God and makes a dua. The dua of the Prophet is the accepted dua. وَقَالَ نُوهٌ رَبِّي لَا تَضَرْ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ دَيَّارًا O oh Allah, and bring forth that punishment from the skies and make sure that no disbeliever lives on the earth. The question that comes over here is that is this really the nature of the prophets of God that they would ask for a punishment to come down and wipe out the entire community? When we hear about the stories of the prophets of God, when we hear the story of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he is known as Rahmatul al-Alameen sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Muhammad. He is the mercy to the world. He is the embodiment or the, or, or, or the reflection of Arham al-Rahimeen. How could it be that they make du'as for the destruction of a community? We come and we see that these prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are the embodiment or the reflection of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they demonstrate that for the course of their life. But when they realize that individuals and only the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have the ability to pass this type of judgment on people, not you or I, we have to assume that every single person is a good individual. When they commit a sin, we have to reflect on our own sins before we pass a judgment on anyone else. But when the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the divine representative of God, he makes a supplication like this, this means that the mercy of God or the mercy of that Prophet, it is no longer existent, right? The, the, that he's offered, he's offered all sorts of support and he's offered all different sorts of avenue for these individuals to fall into belief, but they fail to do so at every single level. Because the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they believe that there's no sort of potential for these people to believe anymore. 
Imam al Hussein, Ahlul Bayt, والسلام, when they come forth to battle, they go and they fight that enemy because they realize that that enemy is no longer going to believe or no longer going to submit. It is said that in the Battle of Siffin, Amir al Mu'mineen had, had chosen Malik al Ashtar, his companion, to be the flag bearer of the army, the commander of the army, on the day of Siffin. It is said that every single time Amir al Mu'mineen would go into battle, Every single individual who he would fight, who he would kill, after he would strike him, he would call out Allahu Akbar. God is great. It is said that Malik al Ashtar was also fighting the opponent. It is said in the midst of the battle, he would turn his back toward Amir al Mu'mineen and says, Oh Amir al Mu'mineen, I've heard you call out Allahu Akbar only 35, 40 times. I've also killed 35, 40 people. Right? We're equal. What's the deal? At this moment, Amir al Mu'mineen says, Oh Malik, he says, because before I strike someone, I know if there's going to be any believer in his progeny from this day until the day of judgment, while you just strike the opponent because they're the opponent. I know that there's going to be no other believer to come from this individual's progeny, otherwise I let him go. Right? We come and we see that the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa they would offer opportunity after opportunity toward people until they realize that's it. These individuals, they're never going to believe. Their children are never going to believe. There's no sort of avail for this group of individuals. And this is out of the mercy of the Prophet, and out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He continues in verse number 27. Kafar. Oh Allah, make sure that you destroy them, make sure that you defeat them, because if you allow them to remain, then the only thing that they will do is allow their ideologies to cause corruption with those people who believe. What lesson can we take from this? That we come forth and we see that there are people who have doubts in regards to their ideology, who have doubts in regards to their belief system. We need to make sure that this aspect of doubt it does not permeate into our minds, into our hearts. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. We have to ask questions. We have to seek the truth, right? But if an individual is only going to bring questions when you have certainty in something, what do we see? That doubt begins to compound and ignorance begins to compound until you begin to lose belief yourself. Which is why narrations of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, have told us to be careful where you attain knowledge from. Be careful, you know, where, who you listen to. Be careful what books you read. Be careful what type of people you discuss, especially matters of religion, matters of belief with. Because it's your belief that is going to be the cause for you to attain salvation or not. If you follow individuals or you sit and you eat and you talk to people who are shaky in terms of their ideology or shaky in terms of their belief, what's going to happen to you? Eventually it's going to rub off on your heart, onto your soul. Everyone has to look out for the salvation on their own. Question then how do individuals, they begin to remove this sort of doubt from their heart once it's present? Narrations of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salatu wasalam, they tell us that in order to remove doubt from your heart, and in order to be make sure that we are submissive toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to follow certain steps. Amongst these steps is to recite the whole Qur'an, read the whole Qur'an, and reflect upon the verses, and these verses, they lead us toward finding sources of certainty. As he mentioned a couple of nights ago, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, go out, look at the sun, look at the moon, look at the stars. These are all avenues for our hearts to be receptive to certainty, right? When you see the beautiful sky, and when you see the sun rising and the sun setting, and when you see the full moon present outside of, you know, your window looking at the horizon, immediately you need to pose the question, is there really doubt in God? Can we really doubt in a creator after we've seen such beauty? You can't. It's impossible to do that. Because if you truly allow for your heart to be receptive, if you truly allow for your mind to contemplate on all of these signs of God, you will force yourself to submit. You will naturally submit toward the creator of the heavens and the earth. It is said that the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he would pray outside, outdoors in the middle of the night. He would look up at the stars and he would raise his hands in the qunut of Salatul Witr perhaps and say, Rabbana, subha- Rabbana ma khalaqta haba batila, subhanak faqina adabinna. O oh Allah, all glory be to you. Surely you did not create all of this as a falsehood. Surely you did not create all of this in vain. There must be a purpose for all of this. 
If you spend one hour, one moment, five minutes in the middle of the night and going outside and looking at the stars and the beauty of this weather that we're having these days in the summertime, look up at the stars and say, Oh Allah, what did you create all of this for? Train your mind to think. Train your mind to reflect and you will realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't create all of this in vain but there's a purpose behind all of this and that purpose will lead you to having certainty in the Creator. Kafar. Oh Allah, if you allow these disbelievers to remain in community and if you allow these disbelievers to remain in the society, what, what, what are you going to find? Except for them confusing others. So get rid of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes Nuh alayhi salam in the last verse of chapter 71, verse number 28. Rabbi wali walidayya wali man dakhala baytiya mu'minan walil mu'minina wal mu'minat wala tazadu dhalameena illa tabara. Oh my Lord, forgive me. At the end of all of this, narrations of Ahl al-Bayt Commentators of the whole of Quran, they state that Prophet Nuh السلام, begins to make this dua after the whole incident of the drowning in the ark and the whole situation. When, he's, when he is, finally has found solace with those small group of supporters and companions that he has. It is said that Nuh السلام, after the, every, you know, everything has been settled down, he, 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 he leaves the ark and he raises his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he begins by stating, Rabbi khfirli. Oh Allah, forgive me. When an individual has attained success, when he makes a lot of dua, when finally God gives him that thing that he has you know, been requesting for years, for months, for days, the first thing that he should do is ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Why? Because when God gives us a blessing, it could be for several different reasons we mentioned yesterday. One of those reasons why God might constantly be giving us blessing is because he doesn't want us to remember him. He wants to move us away like he does to Fir'aun, like he does to other oppressors, right? When you see a king, he's dominating over a region, over a community. He's wealthy, he has money, he has power, he has everything that he could ask for, right? God keeps on giving him more. You wonder why does God keep on giving this individual all of these bounties and all of these blessings, right? Why doesn't God just destroy this tyrant? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to allow for him to never remember God. He wants him to forget God completely. That's what God wants from him. For these type of hard-hearted people, right? We need to make sure that whenever we receive a blessing, we need to thank God for it and at the same time ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness to make sure that that blessing is not because of any sort of sin that I'm committing that God is trying to push me further away. But also perhaps the second reason why Nuh is saying, oh Allah forgive me, is because when an individual, he has built a link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he always sees that every thing that he's done is not enough in terms of pleasing God. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would recite 360 times astaghfirullah rabbi wa atubari every single day. Who compares with the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in obedience to God, in worship of God, right? The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is the cream of the crop in terms of creation. But he repents toward Allah because he sees his own acts of worship as not sufficient in terms of receiving the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So though Nuh alayhi salam has preached for 950 years, though Nuh والسلام, has finally attained solace after all of those efforts, he humbles himself in front of God by asking God for forgiveness. رَبَّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيَّ and, oh, and oh Allah, and forgive my parents. Nuh السلام, perhaps is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness of all of his forefathers, meaning from amongst the prophets. But naturally, we can also take lesson that whenever we're seeking forgiveness for ourselves, also seek forgiveness from our parents because perhaps the cause of this guidance that we are now attaining, a blessing of that, comes from the dua of our parents for us as children. And oh Allah, and have mercy and forgive those who have entered into my home. Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam says. The Mufassirin of the whole Quran state that this could be a number of reasons or meanings behind what does it mean when Nuh alayhi salam says and forgive those who enter into my home. One of those commentaries is that when Nuh alayhi salam says forgive those who have entered into my home, he's speaking about those who entered into his ark. Because according to narrations, they were in the ark for many, many months, for many, many days, or many, many years, perhaps even. 
so that when Nuh is stating, Oh Allah, and have mercy upon those who have entered onto the ark, who have entered into my home, he's speaking, speaking about those who have entered onto the ark. A second interpretation is that when Nuh states, O oh Allah, and have mercy and forgive those who entered into my home, he's speaking about the home of the walai of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning those who have joined the ranks, those who are the followers of the prophets of God, those who are the followers of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those who are the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa O oh Allah, have mercy upon all of those who follow within this legacy of ours from that day of Noah until the very last day, which includes a dua for all of us as believers in the prophets of God. رَبَّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيَّ وَلِمَنْ دَخَلَ بَيْتِيَ مُؤْمِنًا وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ And O oh Allah, and have mercy upon all of the believing men and all of the believing women, right? It is the nature of those who believe, the believers, to always pray for other believers. Fatima al-Zahra, salamu Allah alayha, alayha salatu wa salam, salamu It is said that on that day, she was making dua for the entirety of the night, she is praying for everyone. Imam al Hassan alayhi salatu was salam, is three or four years old on that day. He enters into the room of his mother, Lady Fatima alayhi salatu was salam, and at this moment he sees his mother making dua for everyone for the neighbors, for people on the other side of the world, for every individual. But she doesn't say, Oh Allah, bless my sons Hassan and Hussein, for instance. So, in the midst of Lady Fatima alayhi salatu was salam, making this dua, Imam al Hassan says, Oh my mother, you forgot about me. You didn't pray for me. Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salatu wasalam responds by her famous line, Ya Bunayya, Ajjar thum dar. Pray for your neighbors first, and then you pray for those in your house. So we need to make sure that when we're making dua, like Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam does, that we pray for one another, that we pray for everyone within humanity, and that will be the cause or the facilitation for our du'as to also be accepted. Rabbi ghfir li wali walidayya, wali man dakhala baytiya mu'minan, وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَلَا تَزَدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا تَبَارَ And O oh Allah, make sure that you remove all of those disbelievers from hindering and from permeating our message and our, our ideology. This is the last verse of chapter 71 of the Holy Qur'an, Surah Nuh, and inshaAllah tomorrow night we will begin by reflecting on chapter 72 of the Holy Qur'an, Surah Al-Jinn. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq, that he gives us the ability to consistently remember him by means of his ayat and specifically the verses of the Holy Quran. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammad wa alihi al-tayyibina al-tahirin.